That's a beautiful view of the Irish coast here. We're going to look at an article by Keystone University. Something I want to note. A keystone is the thing at the top of an arch that holds it all together. And indeed, keystones are the foundations of many things. Let's take a look into this. What we're going to talk about today that's just been released from them is Ireland as Atlantis. Ancient Egyptian and Greek clues. Scientists used to work on the assumption that Ireland was completely frozen over during the Ice Age and therefore uninhabitable until around 10,000 years ago or so, right? This assumption has been well and truly shattered by recent evidence. This and other sources of evidence supports the idea that Ireland was perhaps the legendary land of Atlantis. And there are ancient places long lost to people from other lands, talking about their ancient homelands and so on, and Hyperborea, and the ancient land of Doggerland, which we know well of today, and this lost land that some people went away from and came back a different people. I've showed quite a few videos, and this is somewhat of a culmination of them here in a multi-parter, although I'll try to get each one individually set. If we do go to a part two, it's in your top left-hand corner as usual. Ireland in the Ice Age. The Pleistocene Ice Age lasted two and a half million years and ended around 11,600 years ago. The latest research shows that even at the peak of the Ice Age, ice sheets did not completely cover Ireland. This would explain the lack of drumlins, which are egg-shaped ridges formed by glacial activity across the center of the island. And uh, I'm starting to know too much about drumlins after looking at uh, some studies on the flooding and things that came through North America and its twin sister, which is also in the Ural Mountains. And uh, it's a churning of things like this. One thing that people don't realize whenever they think about this, I think, is that during this time the ocean sucked down and it was 400 meters below where it is now and therefore a lot of areas were exposed including Doggerland and this whole area of Hyperborea was more exposed somewhat but also they had glaciers coming into the areas and creeping in and fingers in certain areas but it wasn't completely closed in for where it was really enclosed in and encroaching to is, is north, north of Scotland, up near Orkney Islands and coming across there and freezing across the sea at one point and all north of there and Denmark and these areas and Scandinavia, which are still seen and thought of as pretty much frozen over, at least for most of the year, were at that time under ice. But the one in America was much larger. Another study from Norway proves conclusively that the warm Atlantic Gulf Stream did not stop during the Ice Age as previously thought. This indicates that Ireland's Ice Age wasn't as severe as previous estimates and the evidence has been stacking up to support the claim that Ireland was inhabited by humans much earlier than currently acknowledged. Well, the, the North Sea in there, even though it's so rough today with all of it going on, but that's trapping this place that was supposed to freeze over, right? If we look at the tropical coming in from off of Florida in America across and sweeps across, it brings a whole lot of warmth to an area and it makes things like falcons and canary islands and so on much more tropical than you'd think that they would be in any way. Let's continue. 
a 12,500 year old bare bone that was cut with human tools and found in a county glare cave proves that there were humans living in Ireland during the old Stone Age period, not the new Neolithic period. That's a declamation people quite often try to get together in what is Stone Age. And when you talk about pre-Stone Age to somebody, you're really talking about non-Neolithic or non-advanced stoneworks and things. In these three separate places in Ireland, flint stone tools have been found dating back to 200,000 years and 400,000 years. One find was in Mel County, Luth, 10 kilometers from New Grange. People are familiar with New Grange. There'll be a picture coming up on it, and in fact, I may have that as my opening deal, although there's a video the company's doing, and I may try to do a critique on that also, and in doing so, I'm probably going to use it for that and another one for this, perhaps our opening shot we had there. There's one in Bakehill County down, and one on a remote Aran Islands off the county Galway coast in the Atlantic Ocean. Aran Islands. Aaron, like Aaron, Moses' brother of the Bible. We don't necessarily need to go all there yet, but I did one on Aaron Islands recently, and it showed that LIDAR says it's just covered with stuff. Sur stone circles and things like that. Well, are they big like Stonehenge and stuff? No, it looks like dwellings and stuff a lot in there. In fact, they figured out from a local flint mines and everything that this was the people bringing flint and obsidian to all over Europe and it's been found all over the Middle East too which shattered people's beliefs then well when you start adding up all this shattering of beliefs what are you left with this first picture here is a giant stone axe it would have been cleaved around here and pow 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 tack that way this is your blade but look at these blades here and these cutting blades. Hmm. Flint tools. Mainstream opinion remains that these human flint tools were carried by Ireland, carried to Ireland by ice sheets. This truly bizarre explanation was championed when archaeologists still believe that Ireland was completely frozen over until 10,000 years ago. A view that has been discredited by modern science and the recent evidence suggests that Ireland has been inhabitable or has been habitable for hundreds of thousands of years. This would explain its many unique species of freshwater fish, flora and fauna, which differ significantly from those of neighboring Britain and continental Europe. And some of you that have been with me a long time have realized that I know a lot about saltwater fish, freshwater fish around the world and things, and that it is one thing. They're little fish that they have. They're little, um, oh, they have cute little names for them around in there. I mean, uh, we're not going to go into that. But uh, they, uh, they have variations on a theme, and it's weird, but it's almost like a Galapagos Island. For if you look at that little island set and then what's on the mainland there and the variations of the theme, it does show you things. Well, it seemed to be an oddity until you realize that all that used to be connected somewhat. And then due to having separations and connected and separations and connected and separations is the way that it goes through ice ages. There's been this little evolution and change and sometimes where there was re rehabilitation and other times it may not have been. But we've gone through quite a few ice ages while this is going on leading to modern man. Stone Age man was a lot more mobile than he has been giving credit for, and I've proved that in quite a few of my videos. I won't go into it now, look back on them. Recent scientific evidence proved man sailed to Australia on rafts about 65,000 years ago. I think the statement now is exactly 58,000 BC, so that'd be almost 60,000 years ago. But and as early dating as 65, but the thing that's new that's been found is just like the ocean recedes here, it does around Australia too, duh. And there's this natural spring that's been found and they find uh, early Aboriginal remains that date there 
not from our last ice age coming out, but coming into the last time and it would have been back over and submerged and then back out and then, you know, so that long ago. In Siberian Russia, a 11,005 year old wood carving called the Shigir Idol was found with the unmistakable pattern of Irish Ogham writing, the world's first alphabet carved into it. Ogham writing has also been found in several sites in North America. And I've shown videos about these things and the Shigir Idol I've got a video on. And you can see where they have this notching and this Ogham writing. And we'll take a little example of that, but won't go into it totally. That deserves its own video, and I don't want this to go on and on and on for people. It is somewhat concise. So, in fact, looking at this picture right here, here's an example of Ogham writing. And whether a notch bisects or does not bisect a line, and lines on the bottom and lines on the top and the amount of them, each one signifying vocal sounds. And there have been people that have seen that this actually goes together with the ancient Kipu and a knotted writing of the Aztecs and Mayans that is really, that look like a necklace of strings and knots or something to some people, but they realize that all those knots are like this language and almost like a computer running down the string and that if somebody was still literate in this they'd be able to just sit there and with the string go through and tell you what it was um, so there's also the Egyptian connection which we've made quite a few references to several ancient Egyptian texts including the book of the dead the pyramid text and the hymn of Ramses the fourth tell of ten kings who ruled during the reign of the gods. One of these was Thoth, or Tautus the Phoenician, the founder of the Egyptian civilization, it says, who was born in a distant country to the west, it says, a country which was across a great body of water. And this was traversed again later, but we'll go into that in a minute. Other texts refer to this ancestral territory as the sunset land or the island of the setting sun. Much like Japan is the land of the rising sun and the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and this is the most westerly of lands and so it makes quite good sense. In fact, to this day, Ireland is still referred to as the land of the setting sun. Another name for this land in Egyptian texts was Urani which is etymologically very close to Aaron and has their Urani or their flavor on it that fits with Middle Eastern variations of Proto-Indo-European linguistics, right? And Aaron is the ancient name for Ireland. It's kind of where you get Ayr from or Air, like Aryan right like Aaron like Aaron of the Bible that took over for Moses according to the Egyptian text this island in the Atlantic was overwhelmed by water the ten kings included Thoth traveled east to safely by boat stories tell of the founders of Egypt arriving from an island in the Atlantic around 11,900 years ago. And so we're right there in that same line, in the same timeline. Other people have noticed this and they put things, but we're just going to keep putting things together here, people. If Atlantis and Ireland are one and the same, and some of the survivors of that tsunami or whatever that hit the island escaped by boat to Egypt, then you would expect there to be clear links between the two places. And there are many such links. One of the most interesting of these is genetic. Now, before we get into that, they're saying, well, if the tsunami hit or what hit off of it? Well, we look at the Younger Dryas event, which they're not mentioning in this paper, but the Younger Dryas event 
was a catastrophe that looks like it melted the water extremely rapidly and probably caused tsunamis and th other things up in this area. So it would have been quite devastating for them and it fits the story somewhat. So interesting genetics. Let's see if we can look into that and I might try to skip over here and show you some. The stereotypic Irish combination of red hair and blue eyes, although it's not boom, you know, and milky white skin is the rarest genetic combination on earth. Fewer than one million people or one percent of the global human population possess this genetic combination in a modern day. Ireland has the highest concentration of red-haired genes, though, in the world, and throughout history, pockets of redheads have been found scattered across the globe. These are the descendants of the ancient Irish and include the Phoenicians, the Hebrews, the Berbers or Amazi of North Africa. So you can still find somebody that looks like the picture we're fixing to show here, although they have an ethnic twist to them that's very much a Middle Eastern type of look or a Morocco type of thing for a reason and he mentions and the Indo-European Aryans red-haired mummies have been found all over the world including New Zealand in China and the Terambesa mummies along with blondes so this is not just a red thing but she wants to show that that's even more poignative if you understand Peru has the ancient Wari mummies, and while they have auburn and blonde, they also have some red-headed mummies there, and people have already done tests onto them, and sure enough, it's Caucasian-type hair, and it's naturally those colors, just like the bog mummies, right? Red-haired mummies have been found all over the world, though, including New Zealand, China, Peru, and even Alaska, and I did a, pay, a video on that here not long ago. So we look at somebody that's from there, and while an Irish quite often gets freckles as opposed to tanning easy, if you'll pay attention to it, they actually do get a tan background, but the freckles are little concentrations is all it is. So their melanin then tries to spot up and freckle in places. And you can tell she doesn't have any freckles, although makeup could be covering it up somewhat. Quite often they will not. And this freckling, by the way, they've said genetically, seems to go all the way back perhaps to Neanderthals, and they might have had freckles too. And everybody says, oh, you get it this from Neanderthals and everything. It's possible that went the other way. It's possible a lot of these things went a little the other way. In fact, geneticists are now saying it's quite possible that the mutation that we're seeing, that we're accrediting a large portion of what we're calling Neanderthal DNA to, could be something that happened from a mutation like what's happened through viruses and such, and happened to us both. Entirely possible. Although one could happen to the other and then be passed down. The way that it looks, it's possible it went that other way. Anyhow, beautiful like this, but in Egypt we have the tales of Set and Seth of the Bible, really, is what that is. And Set and Seti and Set worshippers and Seti worshippers were shown to be redheads, and quite often. And so it seems an oddity that they have that almost like whatever color hair you're born with. And also the necropolises show that they're separating bodies between blonde haired brown and black and redheads in their own places and it doesn't seem to be a lineage situation it seems to be declamated by hair color I've done a video about that or two so thousands of fair and red-haired mummies have been found across Egypt the Egyptian Pharaoh Ramses II had red hair and did at least six other pharaohs Despite claims to the contrary, it has been conclusively proven that Ramsey's hair was naturally red, not colored red as the result of dye pigmentation or the embalming process, and it sure wouldn't change into Caucasian hair in the embalming process. The legendary Cleopatra is also said to have had red hair. 
but I think it was more Auburn. So, Ramsey's hair, though, whenever they went through it, they say, well, no, he was gray-haired by the time. He was like 90, 92, but he had gray hair, but they dyed it back to the color of his youth, and they go, well, who's going to do this? So they, they actually have some of his hair and the follicles, and looking at it under a microscope, they go, yeah, yeah, high red pigment, da-da-da-da-da. This looks just like what a redhead looks like today. It hasn't changed. It stayed static. It's amazing they uh, they preserve themselves so well so now in a modern day when everybody tries to end up having questions the reality comes out at the same time the technology needs to isn't that amazing it's just <sighs> further evidence backs up the ireland egypt connection in genetics a haplogroup is a group from the human family tree that traces back one individual one to one individual or ancestor our family group that's connected in such. The Irish are part of the same genetic haplogroup as the lineage of the pharaohs, and in fact the highest concentration of pharaoh Tutankhamun's haplogroup RM269 is found in Ireland, while Tutankhamun's grandmother also had red hair. It's also real common all over Egypt, all Egypt, all over the UK, and concentrated around London. And you see a lot of redhead people around there. Who's the guitar guy that everybody likes right now? He's all just folky and stuff. He's got red hair, but there's so many more. But, hey, Princess Diana, she's a blonde. Prince Charles is dark-haired. But their childs are one that looks like Prince Charles, but a blonde. But losing his hair rapidly as hell. Way quicker than Charles ever did. Like a Greek or something. And the other son looks somewhat like his mother. But he's a ginger, isn't he? Gingers don't get a fair shake either. And that's because of things probably way, way, way in the past. And that deserves its own video. And the rhetoric people get nowadays from South Park, from everywhere, from you hear beating a red-headed stepchild and da-da-da, the whole nine yards. Where does that come from? Well, so not only is this genetics correct, and working out that but it comes from much much earlier and there are red-headed people there way before that here we're just gonna quickly look at something before we go into Menes the very first of the Egyptians um, so we'll look at the daughter of Khufu who is Marisank well, we're not gonna be able to do it Okay, well, I'm going to reload here real quick while I'm talking. What we're going to look at, I waited too long and it totally, sometimes it just does that. Sorry, guys. So what we're going to look at here is not somebody way down in King Tut's dynasties and stuff in the 18th and stuff. We're going all back, all back before the Hyksos ever got there or anything, back in the Wayback Machine, right? And uh, we're going to look at somebody who, even on the walls, which it's a rare thing, but we'll also show you the reason for that rare thing. Where are we at here? 25 minutes coming up on? Good deal. Okay, so let's take a look at here. This is Queen Marisank. She's the daughter of Hetaferes and Prince Kawab and the granddaughter of the Egyptian pharaoh Khufu, or Cheops as we know him. She was the wife of King Khafre. Yep, the other pyramid, the Khafre, that Khafre. Okay, ready? So we're looking at images here. And when we look at images, it shows them. And I don't want to go to each one of these sides to try to look it up. You can tell they're somewhat Caucasian, but they're wearing the wigs and so on. But in her tomb, this is the one that's famous that shows her as a redhead. And it's weird, but it's a blonde, and it's got red ochre line, 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 line all over it. And from a distance, it looks like an orangey strawberry hair like we were looking at it a minute ago. Because they, tr I guess they tried to recreate it. And she's drawn as real, real pale, and then her sister's not drawn as pale for some reason. And then her little brother over here is drawn as darker. Why? Well, Egyptians use red ochre on males, 
pale females. And it's something that you can see in Greek art, Minoan, Mitanni art, and everything all the way through the whole thing. But let's look, uh, where was it? So here's the actual deal on the wall, but that's a washed out picture. And so, I know, wasteful time. So here's the same picture again. And here it is on the wall there. And I think you can even make it out that it's a whole bunch of lines that are horizontal, you know, going this way. All the way across here. Kind of missing them in the very front. Kind of a shiny, like they try to give the appearance and you get away from where it is. So that's Marisonk, right? Well, let's go to... Which one is it? Tour Egypt? Let's look at where that site is that's right there. This is Egypt. Puts out their own thing on it, right? So... What is this? Well, this is that tomb of Marisonk. There's the picture right there that we just looked at. And uh, so it's a Giza pyramid, and I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. Just go over basics with you and something that they say. Here's the shaft tomb and the way that it all looks. And they've got stuff all over the walls and, of course, and everything. Multiple tomb. At this time, and this is very earliest of Egypt, so the art you're fixing to see in a second just really pales in comparison to what comes shortly after. But this is... No, fourth dynasty and so on, right? So, you can see this is kind of eh. But they also tell you, if you read the whole thing here, that they show artisans, artisans on the walls and stuff. It's kind of the first time they ever showed the artisans working and doing things rather than just the, you're fixing to go to the afterlife and blah, 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 and here's fields and stuff. So, but it's a floor plan consisting of rectangular rooms. Now, Marisonk and her mother are depicted gathering lotus flowers and catching birds with nets in the swamps. Here, Hetaferes wears a black lappet wig and is clad in a long white tunic standing in front of a boat with her back to Marisonk, who wears a bandolette around her black hair and a blue bead net over her white garment. Well, this bandolette is a thing that holds your wig on your head but let's continue it should be noted that in other scenes heta fairies has blonde or red hair which is very unusual during egypt's pyramid age they try to say but ah uh, it is not and in fact on the walls you can find blonde haired people and so on and uh I don't see it mentioned right there, but I swear when you read the whole thing, it talks about how she's blonde on the wall. The other girl is blonde on the wall that supposedly had black hair too, with a wig. There she is as a blonde on the wall. Right here. Right? So, blah, 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 and it shows the whole tomb. So if you want to, you know, go to touregypt.com and you can go to these feature stories about Marisonk. And it'll put it there. Marisonk means she loves life. So, and we could, uh, let's see. We could go back from there. And we'll also, just to prove this blue-eyed component, and perhaps the red uh, component, blue-eyed Egyptians. And what you'll notice here is that Nefertiti has one blue eye left, but the other one's missing. But also, all these early statues here all have crystal blue eyes in them. We'll get a better look at some of them, but these are all of the earliest dynasties. Around when we're talking about, 4th, 5th, 6th dynasty, but all the way through the 12th. Here's Hor Aha, supposedly second pharaoh ever, blue eyes. Here's some of the scribes, and quite often you see it in the scribes, but also in the scribes, instead of them making it look, you know, like a god and all this way, exactly. They have some look to them themselves, whatever. And uh, you can see it right here. The Afrocentric nemesis. But it goes even before Egypt started. Here's pre-dynastic Nakata with blue statues from way back when. Yeah, and not only does, uh, and this is no fret, Look how pale she is. Well, she's pale, and her husband isn't quite. And there's more scribes and so on. And here's a bunch of 
red-headed, blonde-headed mummies that they found that have their hair for, it's kind of rare because they usually shave their heads, but they didn't. Oh, and I hate to be zooming like that, but so pale women and red ochre are tan-looking men, and therefore they look like that. Blue-eyed Egyptians. And you can look up blue-eyed scribes and stuff and redhead and see everything. Do that yourself. So now we're just going to go back to the main story and uh, see if we can carry on here. Where are we at? 30 minutes. That was just a little five-minute run. So down here where we were, past redhead, right here actually see if I can get this right real quick for you <laughs> sorry guys <coughs> so that genetics is found with RM269 but also there's recently been a uh, entire study done on hundreds of mummies of uh, 90 something of which that they got the genetics out of three they're in full genetic signature out of them and they're showing that they're um, people that used to live up in Anatolian area all through there, like the Hittites and all those guys, and early European hunter-gatherers. That used to be called Cro-Magnon, but now since they find out they got the genetics out of Cro-Magnon man, and it's still existent today, still here. So that kind of blows the idea about this rapid evolution and changing of one certain people into all these different people. It happened long, long ago and different things happened, but that's not for this video. A hieroglyphic text, which is very telling, found at Abydos by Sir Flinders Petrie himself in 1901 in the Cenotaph of Pharaoh Menes, says, King Menes, the ruler of Mizraim, Egypt, Mizraim is what it's called in the Bible, made the complete course to the end of the sunset land sailing in ships he completed the inspection of the western lands he built there a holding in urani land at the lake of the peak fate pierced him by a hornet or a bee sting this drilled tablet set up of hanging wood is dedicated <coughs> to his memory pardon me <coughs> So you're always taught that Narmer died from a hippopotamus and carried him off or drowned him or did these things every to him, but uh, you haven't heard probably about this hornet or this bee sting type thing, but hey, people can be allergic to bees and it's amazing what can happen. But there's more to that bee story and bee connections. We've already made it in some other videos and in the interest of keeping going, I'm continuing. As already mentioned, Urani is another name for Ireland. Intriguingly, when Pharaoh Menes' Egyptian tomb was opened, it was found to be empty and his body was elsewhere. Explorer Lawrence Waddell discovered the final resting place of Menes in Nachmany County, Tyrone, Ireland. Yes, Tyrone is Irish and actually comes from Proto-Indo-European linguistics and the people of Tyre. He described how Sumerian linear writing on a boulder stone at the site was almost identical with that found in the pharaoh's empty Egyptian tomb. <coughs> I'm going to have to grab a drink in a minute. It seems that Menes died from a bee sting in Ireland and was buried in Nachmany County, Tyrone. Although the site had never been excavated to confirm this find, nor indeed has Scotia's grave in County Kerry which is widely accepted as being a resting place of an Egyptian pharaoh's daughter who arrived in Ireland around 1700 BC. And this is supposed to have been after Akhenaten got disposed and his family line was taken out of the situation and sent off. And people say, well, that's Mariotta Moon, that she's known as Scotia, or Little Flower. And that's where Scotland gets her name. In fact, she's a redhead, and from the lineage that come down from her, along with these other people that are redheads, through there comes Mary, Queen of Scots. 
In fact, very few of Ireland's ancient sites have been excavated. It must be the least excavated place on Earth. However, some startling evidence has been found that a handful of sites that have been examined. A royal Egyptian faience bead necklace was found at the Hill of Tara in County Meath during an excavation in 1955, which I did a video on, while a 2,500-year-old Barbary ape skull native to North Africa was also found during excavations at Nevon Fort in County Armagh. And I did a video about that too and how they tried to relate it to Thoth and all the things that go along with it and making more connections. And while some of these guys, admittedly, are a little bit loose, sometimes exaggerated and perhaps putting a little much emphasis somewhere more than it should be, at the same time, it shows the reality of it all. If you smooth down that bump of reality, it's still there, and now it's all smoothed in, and it's still all there. The importance of stone circles. And I uh, did a video recently about this, so this kind of clicks and goes together with it. Perhaps the most telling of all is Nabda Playa Stone Circle, which is located 804 kilometers or 500 miles south of Cairo, deep in the Nubian Desert, an area once that enjoyed seasonal rainfall for fall and fertile soil. Tried to get that out in one word. And so it used to have a lot of rainfall there and things until lo and behold but surely it became a desert in a more arid land and I've done videos about this also let's continue Nabda Playa is one of the oldest stone circles in the world and is considered the birthplace of the Egyptian civilization stone circles are also known as druid circles the builders of this stone circle predated the spectacular Egyptian civilization that followed Stone circles and megalith are found all across the world in virtually every country, proving the entire world has a spectacular ancient history that most people are completely ignorant of. But I've done quite a few videos in these last few years on my channel showing you circles here, circles there, circles here, here it dates here, here it dates here. Hmm, I wonder if that, that's got to be the same people too. Wow, here it is again. Wow, here it is again. Well, they have a circle and it just keeps adding up and it eventually went off to something that looked like conjecture it really did it, it admittedly but one of the driving forces that got me really going back on this again was the fact of them finding Gobekli Tepe because once they found Gobekli Tepe it verified the origins and how much older this had really gone. And we thought, you know, if there were any runes, they were all gone long ago. Well, luckily, they buried that damn thing. In fact, there are seven sites that have that going on in Anatolia. And lo and behold, they're all attached to the same people. And I've made a few videos about it. And how it attaches, and who's an elf, and a brownie, and a fairy. And the people of old mythology. But the builders of those megalithic circles originated where the most spectacular Stone Age constructions on Earth are found in Ireland. But in a time before these same people had been quite rampant about being able to go everywhere in fact it it seems weird to people that the Phoenicians boats looked kinda like the Vikings but to people once they figure it all out although that's separated by a long period of time that's not In Jophus, Joseph Gwilt's timeless masterpiece, The Coffee Will Kick In, the Encyclopedia of Architecture, he informs us that the Druid stone circles predated all other forms of architecture and that Druids were the world's first race of civilized people and that one time the language and alphabet of the entire ancient world from Ireland to India was the same, that of the Irish Druids. And if you'll look up 
Proto-Indo-European linguistics, you'll actually see how they all connect and how they run back and that Irish is looked at as one of the roots along with Sanskrit. And oddly enough, they say some of the closest forms are the Aryan language that was imparted to Sanskrit and ancient Irish. It's amazing. But the most amazing thing is if you take it back from Celtic and Old World versions another notch, they get more similar. And if we take it back another hypothetical notch, which they're going to speak about, I believe, here shortly, it ends up being to where all these people could understand each other in a time of, of one language, like they speak of in the Bible before the Tower of Babel, which I've done videos about too. The Greek Connection The Greek history contains a detailed record of how Pythagoras, who predated Plato by almost a century, learned from an Irish druid called Abaris, who could speak fluent Greek as if he had spoken it all of his life. The ancient Irish annals confirm that an Irish druid called Abaris visited Greece, among other places, on his travels. The Greeks described Abaris as a healer and a prophet from the mystical land of Hyperborea, which just like Atlantis was another name for the area around Ireland. Hmm. Hercules and Perseus, two of the most important characters in Greek mythology, were both said to have visited Hyperborea, which was described as being a fertile island to the north of Gaul or France with oak trees, which are sacred to the Druids, a circular temple, perhaps Newgrange, and priests with harps. According to the Greeks, Hyperborea was governed by the Boreids. In Irish, Boreidach means noble chieftain. Clearly, Ilern is that Greek, Hyperborea. The Oracle of Delphi. That's pretty important here. It's the most sacred site in ancient Greece. It was founded by three prophets from the sacred island of Hyperborea, it said, who took up residence there. The Greeks called these prophets Pegasus, Aegeus, and Olin, which is a corruption of the three ranks of the Druids, Bagios, Agios, and Olin. But we also see Pegasus deified into a constellation of these people who had to do with horses. The Greek Phoenicus describes the Hyperboreans as being of the ancient blood of the Titans of old. And if y'all have been watching my videos the last couple of years, I am sure there is a giant connection being made at this moment. It's like whenever you have a puzzle and you may have the rim and some parts going on and you found some that go together and they're all connected over here separately and then one day you realize not just one part fits but this whole thing snaps right into place and makes a oh my gosh look what we're looking at. The word Atlas literally means the island of Atlas. The Titan Atlas was a key figure in Greek mythology and is depicted as being the bearer of the heavens and the guy that holds up the earth and everything, right? And he has his Hesperides down below him and stuff, right? In the garden. Well, the Atlas Mountains are over in North Africa and it doesn't appear there's really a garden there anymore. And is that a transplantation or where does that come from? Well, it comes from people from way back when, and that name has been stayed there. The Titan Atlas was a key figure in Greek mythology, as depicted as being the bearer of the heavens. According to early Greek mythology, Atlas lived on the sacred island of Hyperborea, which is also the location of the garden 